bringing you another chapter. Here we are. I'm um, in my green hat. Uh, my last video, I had all green on, but I had to take it off because it's getting a little stuffy in this room. So I'm in my normal attire, in my whatever this is, little thin hoodie thing. And I am ready for another video. I just refreshed my coffee, so I'm good to go. So what are we talking about today? I have absolutely no idea. Okay, we are discussing exercise and sport psychology. This is chapter number eight for the intro class. Now, I say all of these chapters are important. All of them are important in some way, somehow. Uh, and even the ones we don't go over are still important. This one is important because when you think about it, this is what kind of controls everything, right? Our mind, how we think, how we think of ourselves, how we think of exercise, how we are motivated to perform exercise, to actually participate in a sport, to go to the gym, to pump out that last rep, to finish that last mile. These are the things that exercise psychologists might study. Now, in psychology as a whole, you might start even going in a rabbit hole, too, of the sense of oneself and free will. And some of that I've actually gone into. This is a field that I think if, if things have maybe turned out a little bit differently in my uh, education, I may have gone into something with psychology, sports psychology, uh, possibly neuroscience. I don't think I would have been a brain surgeon or, or anything like that, but I, I think I probably would have went into something related to that just because I, I enjoyed learning about the brain, how, uh, how we think about ourselves, how we, um, evolve in terms of our brain and how we mature, uh, how the brain controls our body, the things we don't know about the brain yet that are being studied, these are some of the things that are very, very important in sport and exercise. Because again, it kind of controls everything. It determines a lot of times how we are going to perform, how we are going to train and how we are going to reach our goals. For instance, roughly 50% or so. Uh, some of the numbers that I've seen, uh, about 54, 56% of the individuals who have a new year's resolution actually meet some of those goals. Most of the goals that they set forth. Now, most of the time that is survey research that is being done. So how truthful they're being, who knows, but if there are thousands of participants in that study, more than likely it's probably a good representation of the actual people who reached those goals and who weren't lying or uh, stating some hyperbole about the goals that they had and what they actually achieved. So about roughly 50%, so 50-50, meaning that there was about 50% of the population who make a New Year's resolution to lose weight, to exercise, maybe get more sleep, change something about their lives could be stopping, uh, stop smoking, um, whatever it might be. Why is that? Why is only, why are only 50% actually reaching those goals? And a lot of this, when we talk about sport and exercise, we are asking the question of not just have they reached the goals, but did they drop out? Are they still doing the exercise? Because even if they did not reach a certain goal, if they're still going to the gym, if they're still getting up in the morning uh, or even in the evening or maybe in the afternoon, maybe they're doing some sort of workout, that's still good in the long run. But did people actually drop out? Is that the reason that they didn't reach their goals? And that's an important question. Why did they drop out? Why are they not participating in that exercise anymore? Why did they spend so much money on a gym membership and they went for a couple of weeks, a few weeks, maybe. And now they're not going anymore. They're spending money. They basically wasted money on something that they are no longer using. 
So they, it'd be like if you got a subscription for any of the number of things that we have subscriptions for nowadays. Um, back in my day, yeah, when I was, when I was a kid, teenager, it was maybe a magazine subscription, but now you have subscriptions for Netflix or Hulu, or even YouTube has subscriptions now, or maybe some certain podcasts or whatever it might be. Say you get a Netflix subscription and you never use it. You never watch anything on, on, on Netflix. What, what's the point? You just kind of wasted money. Why would you stop? It's the same thing with why would somebody spend money on something for an exercise routine for, to try to change their lives? Why would they actually stop that? And that's maybe one question. That's one of a numerous number of questions that an exercise in sports psychologist might ask. And there's also another story that I'll uh, tell you here at the wrap up of this video. And that one is, um, is going to be a very specific, uh, instance, uh, that I talked with an exercise psychologist. So, but anyway, without any further ado, let's go ahead and get into the slides and, uh, get going with this chapter number eight exercise in sport psychology. Let's get into this. So what is exercise in sport psychology? Well, exercise psychology specifically is referring to the application of psychology to promoting, explaining, maintaining, and enhancing physical fitness. And really anything to deal with exercise as a whole. And that can include just normal physical activity, daily living activities. The sports psychology is taking those applications of the psychology principles and applying them to any sport or any competitive event. Now the two were used interchangeably, but a lot of times they do have a separate definition that we do need to uh, be aware of. Now we can separate this even further into the applied versus the clinical. The applied exercise and sports psychologists will apply knowledge that is gained from research studies and those peer reviewed journal articles and apply that to a real world setting such as program adherence, which is what I was discussing in the intro to this video was why does somebody adhere to a exercise program and this other person does not, maybe they're similar individuals and they have similar goals, but why did one continue the program and one dropped out? We'll also look at the communication. This communication could be communication between coaches and athletes could be personal trainer and their clients, strength and conditioning coaches, and the athletes, and also the coaches, and maybe the parents get involved, maybe talking about physicians as well, and how sometimes those communications can break down and why communication is important between all of these individuals to help promote and maintain and progress the athlete to reach peak performance. Let's go into this concept of exercise adherence just a, just a little bit more. So you're following the recommended frequency, the intensity, and the duration. So all of those should be at play uh, when you're adhering to the exercise protocol and the programming that someone has uh, either maybe put forth to that individual or that they set for themselves. Now, again, there's about a 50% dropout rate for most of the numbers. Some of those numbers can vary a little bit depending upon what data set you're looking at. Uh, a lot of the, um, a lot of the survey stuff is maybe a little bit higher than 50%, maybe 55, 56% of the individuals do continue the exercise, uh, or some sort of change. Again, it could be, uh, you know, slowing their smoking down. It could be eating better, uh, you know, whatever those goals are, but a roughly 50% dropout or stop trying to reach those goals. So why is that? Now there's a psychological component to it. Uh, there could be something in the brain. The brain chemistry could be affecting that. There could be something physiological with that as well. And that if someone gets an injury or maybe has a disease or some sort of condition that is limiting their adherence, and their ability to perform those exercises, then that's going to cause them to possibly drop out of the exercise. There could also be a socioeconomical side to this as well, because it does cost some money at times, depending upon 
what type of training somebody wants to go through. If they're wanting to go to a gym and actually perform these exercises on advanced equipment, or they want to go run on a treadmill versus going outside, because going outside can sometimes be dangerous depending upon what neighborhood they live in and where they are located. Uh, it could also be that they don't have the funds to be able to buy a treadmill, but they want to do some sort of exercises at home. They don't want to just uh, simply run in place. Uh, they don't have the room. And even if you're an apartment, if you're an apartment building and you're on anything other than the ground floor, there's likely someone below you that is going to be really annoyed once you start jumping around and doing certain types of exercises. Some of the associations that were developed in sport and exercise psychology, International Society of Sport Psychologists, uh, the North American Society for Psychology of Sport and Physical Activity, as well as the Association for Applied Sport Psychology. Any, any one of these organizations will be good to um, look into, possibly become a member of. I'm sure they have student member fees that are likely going to be cheaper than if you uh, got a professional membership fee once you get into those fields. Uh, and from these, if you're interested in sport and exercise psychology, most of these organizations are going to have on their websites a list of schools that maybe have accredited programs or programs that are starting up graduate programs so that once you leave Wilmington with a undergraduate undergraduate degree in exercise science, you could get into some of those programs. So they'll have a list of them, what maybe some of the prerequisites are. So if you're thinking about sport and exercise psychology, likely you're going to need a couple more psychology courses to get into some of those programs. So you would need to try to plan for that later on, uh, maybe in your junior and senior year. Uh, but if you're inter interested, definitely take a look at some of the schools, uh, look at some of the organizations so that we can get you on the right track uh, so that you don't have to be taking extra courses maybe over uh, the summer between senior year and getting into a program. Or maybe once you get into the program, they might admit you under the assumption that you were going to make up for some of those courses you didn't take in your undergraduate work your first semester as a graduate student. So that way you can get in uh, the program without having to take some extra courses right off the bat. So since psychology is the study of the mind, uh, it is the study of the mind, but we have to be aware of the body as well. And especially exercise and sports psychologists, not only do they have to know the mind and the neuroscience with the brain, but they also need to know the physiology of the body and how those two interact. So there's a multifaceted layer layering system here that everybody in sport and exercise psychology kind of needs to know. And there's also some social aspects to it as well. So some so sociology is going to be somewhat important also. So some social, social psychological factors that could influence someone's behavior. This is one of the things that I'm very interested in. This is um, something I've, I've started to kind of read up on. Uh, and some of my, some of the books that I've been reading lately past year, year and a half or so, mostly because of the pandemic, um, why people believe certain things, why people don't believe other things. Um, how do, uh, people behave? Why do people behave in a certain manner? Um, these are some things that I'm interested in. I'm, I'm, I'm looking in, at this from the outside. I like to, um, take a step back and, I want to know why I want to know the science behind a lot of stuff. So that's kind of why I've gotten interested in some of these, uh, social, social psychological factors and behavior. Also the psychological effects uh, that are derived from participation in exercise and sport. This is a major, major factor in the importance of sport. Most people, most athletes, who are participating in any of the sports that are available way down to, um, you know, people who are five, six years old playing T-ball or kickball or whatever it might be all the way up to college athletes. Most of those people will never play for money, meaning that they will never be a professional. I'll never get uh, endorsements. 
in any way. Uh, they may make money from it at some point, maybe coaching uh, or training in some way, but they'll never be a professional. But there are other aspects to sport that are very beneficial for society and for that individual themselves, such as being able to play on a team and getting along with people that you maybe wouldn't necessarily get along with in other situations. And someone you may actually not like at all. Their personality, you, both of your personalities clash. You don't have the same interests. You just have differing opinions, but you have one thing in common. You play this one sport and your goal is to beat the other team. How do you work with that person? How do you separate all the other stuff, all the other baggage and focus in on the common goal? Uh, and that's important. That's an important factor, especially growing up in youth sports. You, uh, it's, it's a good way to, for them to learn how to play with other, uh, other people and have sportsmanship. And that's kind of part of the sportsmanship is, um, being able to get along with not only the other team and not, I guess, acting like a jerk to them, but also getting along with your teammates, even though you might not see eye to eye all the time. And that's, that's an important part there. But also possibly even learning the, um, the importance of physical activity and uh, the process of learning a new skill. Those are all important. So what are some of the psychological effects of that? Um, what are some ways of coaching that are beneficial and maybe uh, detrimental to learning a new skill and budding some of those psychological um, positives such as being able to get along with other people and then enhancing the experiences of individuals prior to during, and then following participation in exercise and sport shifting gears into some of the specific terms that you might see in psychology. And we can apply this to exercise and sports psychology. So the first one here being personality. So these are entire qualities and traits. So the character and the behavior that are specific to somebody. And these are going to play a pretty vital role in the behaviors that somebody is going to exhibit. Are they a mean person? Uh, do they get a little testy quickly? Are they really nice? Are they uh, constantly trying to uh, resist somebody teaching them something, but some people were just like that. They, they have a, um, an aversion to somebody telling them that either they're not doing something properly or they're not good at the moment. And this is what they need to improve on. Or some people might be asking, what am I doing wrong? Constantly asking, what, what am I doing wrong? Was that good? Was that bad? Why do people behave that way? So that's all personality. And sometimes that's just a natural personality, personality that comes out of people. Sometimes it's a learned personality and there's certain aspects of a personality that somebody can, can learn, can pick up on from maybe other people could be from their parents, could be from their friends, could be influenced by social media or TV or movies, whatever it may be. But all of that is encompassing what we refer to as a personality motivation, probably the number one factor that we think about in exercise and sport and just physical activity, just in general. And it doesn't even have to be an exercise and physical activity. It can be in anything that we're doing in life. What is motivating you to be here to get an undergraduate degree? What, why, what is the motivation? What is the motivation for you to get up in the morning, go to class, maybe go to, um, to practice, maybe go back to class and then do it all over again. What's actually motivating you? Well, what is motivation? What can you actually think about what that means? I mean, you can see it on the screen here and you can look it up, but do you have some sort of definition in your mind? We all probably understand it but maybe we don't have a, an actual definition of it. 
So the actual definition of it is complex set of internal and external forces that influence individuals to behave in a certain way. So we could have this internal structure in our minds saying, get up, get up. It's, it's six o'clock. You need to get up. You need, you need to go train or you need to go get a shower, go get something to eat, go to class and go on through the day. And you constantly have this talking, this internal discussion with yourself throughout the day. So that's kind of internal, your, uh, your, your go to itiveness, if you will. And then there's also some external forces. There are going to be people that are influencing, influencing you to make sure that you're doing something properly or actually doing something in general, such as your coaches, your professors, your advisors could have some sort of mentor, uh, could be your friends, could be your family, parents, whoever it might be. So you're going to behave in certain set of ways because of both the internal struggle that you have with yourself, but also these outside influences that are uh, trying to motivate you, uh, trying to uh, uh, get you in the right direction each day, basically. Also the extrinsic. So to gain some external award, and then you have the intrinsic, which is uh, you enjoy the process, basically. So we have this extrinsic motivation that if, if there's something to be gained, actually something tangible, such as a, a piece of paper or some extra letters behind your name or some money, and that money could be an increased raise. That's a motivating factor. That's an extrinsic factor. You get some sort of an award for that. Again, something usually that's tangible. The intrinsic is that you are doing this because you absolutely love it. You get joy out of it. You feel uh, a sense of uh, uh, pleasure. You feel uh, a euphoria because of doing this. And most athletes actually have that. Most athletes are playing a sport because they love the game. Uh, that's the whole reason why the NCAA does not want players to be paid is because that, that they want to keep that intrinsic factor at play. They, they, um, a long time ago, they said, no, we don't want this extrinsic motivation, uh, or any type of extrinsic motivating factor other than maybe some awards or something like that, but nothing, uh, monetary related. Not to say that NFL athletes or, or any other professional athletes are playing the sport just simply because they're making money. Some of them, maybe, that could possibly be. But there's always going to be the intrinsic factor that you love it, that you love actually doing it. We can even apply this to your career. For my job, I love this. I, I get joy out of teaching. I get joy out of uh, relaying information to somebody else as long as they're willing to listen, even if they're not willing to listen. I still like still like giving some information out. That's why I like telling personal stories at, at times. And some people get bored by it. Some people might roll their eyes like, oh, he's going on another rant again or another tangent. Most of the time they have a purpose. And that purpose is because I, I, I enjoy giving this information and trying to relate some of these uh, life experiences that I've had to you or anyone who's willing to listen and trying to relate it to the actual lecture itself. That's intrinsic. The ext extrinsic factor is that I know that at some point I'm getting paid for it as well. And yeah, that's a motivating factor. That's one of the motivating factors to be honest of why I teach maybe certain courses, or certain number of courses, and maybe a certain number of courses at certain times. Money isn't the most important thing in life, but I rank it right below oxygen. That was actually from a speech, a graduation speech, one of the very few that I actually remember. It was from my undergraduate uh, graduation speech uh, some guy gave. He was talking about money and salaries and stuff, but uh, yeah, we'll just move on. So extrinsic and intrinsic it doesn't mean that extrinsic is bad and intrinsic is good. It's just trying to separate the two into this is the stuff that is motivating us. 
that is not uh, an internal pleasure that we're having versus here. There's something tangible that we're getting from it. That's really all that it's doing. It's neither good nor bad either way. Well, it could be good or bad either way, depending upon the circumstance. If someone has some sort of extrinsic motivation that is maybe illegal, then maybe it's definitely a bad thing, but that's a whole nother issue. Continuing on with the study of the mind and the body, let's look at this concept of arousal. Now we have two different theories of arousal, but first, what is arousal? What does it actually mean? So we have a heightened state of physiological and psychological activity. So this is going to change depending upon the environment, depending upon certain situations. It could be the time of day. It could be the literal environment. Is it cold out? Is it warm out? Is it hot and humid out? Are there a lot of media there at the event? A lot of people watching you and only you. What is it that drives us and how do we actually get aroused? So we have the drive theory and the inverted U theory. The drive theory uh, isn't the one that is generally seen as the correct one. We'll see the inverted U here in a minute, but the drive theory did state that if we look in the X axis here, we got level of arousal And then we have quality of performance on the y-axis. And as our level of arousal increases, so does our quality of performance. So there was a very positive relationship here, positive correlation between the two. However, the inverted U theory is basically stated, uh, which it's basically just an N. (laughs) Inverted U is an N. I don't know why they just call it the the N theory, but uh, yeah, I don't know. The inverted U hypothesis. So this is stating that there is a certain point at which there is diminishing returns on arousal. So you get up to a certain point of arousal. So moderate, maybe slightly above moderate arousal. And you've reached your peak performance. And if you become more aroused, more, uh, you have a more heightened sense Uh, more physiological and psychological activity, this could actually cause a diminishment in performance. Some of this is probably going to be physiologically related, but it could even be psychologically related. So for instance, if somebody is public speaking, I do public speaking a lot, obviously, uh, but anyone, even when I'm up in front of a very large group of people who I don't know, when I'm up in front of a class, I'm pretty calm because I, because I know you guys, uh, maybe the first day of class get a little bit of butterflies, uh, especially if you're freshmen, I get nervous too. If I'm up in front of a group of people of a hundred or so people and I've never met them before and I'm speaking about something else other than maybe this or whatever other lecture I'm giving, I'm a little bit nervous. Sometimes though I'm nervous wreck. But that's actually kind of a good thing. Uh, Maybe not complete nervous wreck, but being a little bit nervous is actually a really good thing. The reason is because uh, from our uh, physiological side and aspect, we have a heightened, uh, we have an increase in adrenaline known as epinephrine and norepinephrine. Uh, We also have the fight or flight response, which is part of that. And that actually causes us to be able to focus a little bit better. And it's the same thing that's going to happen when we're exercising or performing in some sport. And that's a good thing to be nervous, have a little bit of butterflies in your stomach. But if it gets too much, then our mind starts wondering and we don't have the ability to focus nearly as well as what we should be able to. So that's where the diminishing uh, of, of performance comes is that our, our minds are not able to focus. Uh, we may have maybe too much endorphins being released. Uh, and in that case, again, we're over aroused and our performance is going to decrease. So that's likely, uh, the case here, this inverted U hypothesis is generally seen as the one that's pretty much correct. Now, there's going to be some variation to it. 
but um, for the most part, uh, there's going to be a certain point in time where the performance is just going to drop off. Now, this figure here, this is known as the iceberg profile. Now, this is actually showing why Jack could have fit on the door at the end of Titanic. No, I'm, I'm just joking there. Every time I talk about the iceberg theory, uh, they, um, the, the movie Titanic always comes to mind because obviously the Titanic hit an iceberg and the movie was probably one of the greatest movies ever made, right? So <laughs> if you've never seen Titanic, more power to you. So what this is actually showing, this is the iceberg profile. This is uh, a depiction of what is occurring between normal uh, average population versus somebody who is uh, an overachiever. I'm going to say overachiever, somebody who is achieving at a high level of performance. Someone maybe who was a professional athlete or a really, really good athlete in high school or, or collegiate sports. So you can see the dotted line here, and this is at 50, 50. Uh, and, and this 50, these are kind of arbitrary numbers, but let's just say 50 is the average of the population, that dotted line. And you have a couple different parameters down here. You have tension, depression, anger, vigor, fatigue, and confusion. So something like tension, depression, and anger and fatigue and confusion, those are more of a negative attributes. So those are below the average population for somebody who is, a, who is performing at a high level. So those are below uh, those, uh, whatever parameter you're using to determine tension, depression, anger, fatigue, and confusion are below the average population's numbers. Something like vigor or uh, motivation or the ability to perform the sport and perform the exercises, even though maybe they don't want to, or maybe they're having a bad day, to be able to get through some of those tough times. They are above the average population's numbers. So if you look at a iceberg, and this is the reason why it's called an iceberg profile is if you look at an iceberg, a third of the iceberg is above the water. Two thirds of it is below the water. And that's basically what this is showing here is that you have this very small little peak above the water, which is this dotted line. And most of it is down below the water line. That's why it's called the iceberg profile. So, but obviously uh, shows, um, shows an important aspect in characteristics of somebody who is performing at a high level, such as Leonardo DiCaprio in all of his movies. Another aspect is attention. Attention is important because if we're not attentive, then we can't focus. And this kind of goes back to the arousal and some of the hypotheses surrounding that. So the ability to focus on a specific skill or activity. Again, if we're too aroused, we may not be able to put forth enough attention. We may not be able to focus in on that one specific activity. So the concentration has um, four components here. So focus on relevant clues, uh, maintaining the focus, uh, awareness of the situation as a whole, and then also shifting focus whenever necessary. And if you look at athletics, a lot of these uh, components are in all of athletics. We need to be able to focus on relevant clues of what we need to be focusing on, uh, being able to maintain focus at different points in time. If you think of maybe sports with a ball, such as a batter with a ball, uh, awareness of the situation. So one example I'll give is I was a catcher. And if you have ever caught before baseball or softball, you know that you're, you're basically the, the quarterback of the field. Uh, everyone always thinks the, the pitcher is the leader in, in a baseball diamond, but really it's pretty much the catcher. Uh, in some aspects, it's probably going to be the coach because they may be relaying signs. But anyway, neither here nor there. The catcher really needs to make uh, sure that they are focused in on certain clues of what's going on in the bases. What are the base runners doing? Uh, picking up on certain things, uh, certain tendencies that base runners may have, or maybe batters may have, or maybe other coaches may have their players do. But able, able to maintain focus on the, uh, the runners or focus on what, what the pitcher's doing. And then also the awareness of the situation. If there is a guy on first and a guy on third and they're trying to steal second, well, okay. 
we know that if you try to third down the second, that person at third base might try to steal home. Okay. But if that person at third base is a second stringer or you've seen him run bases or her and they are not very fast, you could probably throw down the second and get away with it. Right. You need to be aware of the situation. You need to be able to focus in on those things and be able to um, put forth some algorithms in your head very quickly, but also shifting focus when necessary. So you're focusing on, on the base runners and seeing, seeing what they're doing, but now you need to focus in on what the pitcher's doing. And is the pitcher trying to relay some information to you? And now the coach is saying something. And then now the pitch comes, the batter hits the ball, and it's a, uh, a bloop single. Just goes over the second baseman's head. The third baseman is not, did not run. So now you need to be aware that, hey, you need to yell to everybody to throw it to home. Forget about the other base runners. So those are some things you need to be aware of. In all athletics, there's going to be situations like that. Everybody needs to be able to focus and have attention and be able to shift attention quickly. And uh, really good athletes can do a really good job of that. I think I was moderate at best, <laughs> Maybe I, I think I did okay, but um, I love watching catchers because they are able to uh, to be able to control the field. Uh, so sometimes uh, that's not obvious, but they do tend to be the ones that that, that control uh, the infield for, for the most part, anyway. All right, moving on. Enough personal stuff about me. So anxiety, depression, and psychological well being. So anxiety. Uh, so these are terms we've all heard before, but Anxiety is the state of uneasiness and apprehension related to uncertainties. We all have times at which we are anxious and it's because nobody knows what's going to happen. Now we can relieve some of that anxiety. There's some certain exercises that we can do exercises of the mind, possibly meditation could, um, could be actual actual physical exercise to help relieve some of that anxiety, but also preparing actually going through training protocols and practicing correctly and making sure that you have everything down to a T that can help relieve some anxiety. But again, some anxiety is going to be okay, but not a lot, not a lot because that's going to cause you to lose focus. Depression. Depression is a state of general emotional dejection and withdrawal. Uh, Depression is and has been a, uh, a growing phenomenon and uh, someone who is clinically depressed has actually been uh, increasing as well or has increased. Uh, some of it goes to social media. That's where some of the blame is. Uh, there's some other societal issues that are causing this. Uh, we can't put blame on one specific thing. Uh, under most circumstances, there's going to be a whole myriad of issues. Um, but, um, you know, what is causing this depression and, uh, athletes can get it just as easy, uh, can get clinically depressed, uh, just not the average population. Somebody who's maybe working a lot in their job and uh, maybe things aren't going right at home or whatever it might be. Everybody can go and everybody has the exposure to all of these things and, we can all go through it. So it's just not going to isolate in certain pockets of a population. It's just going to be, uh, anybody can get it, but how do we prevent it? And how do we treat people when we go, uh, get into that, um, that state of mind, then psychological well being. So this is instead of enhanced or improved psychological states, um, could even be a decrease in psychological well-being as well. And that could be that, uh, somebody's, uh, really depressed. They're really anxious. Um, you know, there's a whole lot of things that can go, go on, uh, with somebody where, uh, they just don't feel well about themselves, but also just increasing and improving the psychological states. How can we in, improve them? How can we be more positive throughout the day? Uh, how can we kind of clear the mind? Uh, kind of forgive and forget, not just somebody else, but also yourself. Uh, there's a whole lot of psych, uh, psychology surrounding that of improving the, just the overall psychological well-being. All right, to wrap this chapter up, we know uh, from previous chapters, but also as a society, we know based upon data that we have that regular physical activity reduces 
the risk for cardiovascular disease, the risk for certain types of cancers. We know for sure that it helps to promote weight loss, maintaining healthy body weight, and just overall healthy body itself. But we do know now, based upon the data that we've gotten, it does reduce stress, depression, and also helps to increase self-esteem. Now, there are some uh, some smaller issues going into physical activity and stress, depression, and self-esteem in that somebody could develop some sort of disorder where they're maybe over-exercising or maybe have a body image disorder where that's maybe causing some stress and some depression, uh, some low self-esteem. Uh, and there's also some, uh, some aspects too that, um, and I've seen this, uh, seen some data on this and I, I don't, I haven't seen a lot of data on it, but I have read in a couple of different places, the characteristic that some people who are really high achievers actually have low self-esteem in that that could have actually helped them become high achievers because they, they were always down on themselves. They were always very critical of themselves and of their performances. So how much that actually plays a role and how many people actually have that type of characteristic. I don't know. Um, so that's something to maybe even study in the future. That's actually a really good question. So if you want to go into sports psychology or exercise psychology, that might, that might be something to, uh, to investigate. In fact, that would be a fairly easy investigation to start. And we can maybe even start that if you're interested in something like that, maybe for a thesis, uh, in, uh, excess 496. So, Ah, just think about that. It might, that might even be something um, that uh, maybe we could do in class, something like that. So anyway, all right, that was chapter number eight, exercise and sports psychology. And I'll be here for the wrap up here in uh, three, two, one, and <gasps> I'm back. There I am. Again, I'm not looking at the camera. I'm looking down here at the screen because that's where my face actually is. So the exercise and sport psychology. Again, this is a field that I, I think if I, if, if things would have turned out maybe slightly differently, I probably would have went into maybe something similar to this. Um, just because I, I like learning about the mind. Um, I'm, I'm starting to get into some of it. Uh, I've got into, uh, some reading about, um, you know, belief systems and how the mind works. Uh, how we uh, change our minds, how we change opinions. And, and there's a whole other, um, I don't know, genre, I, I guess the, that I got into, I'm not going to go into some of the stuff that I've, uh, I've read or anything because neither here nor there, not really that important. Um, but I'm starting to dive into the actual inner workings of the, of the mind and to neuroscience. I'm constantly trying to learn about it. That's why this chapter is, uh, at first when I was teaching this class way back when, Oh my goodness. 2013, somewhere around there was the first time I taught the intro class. Um, oh man, it was, this was kind of a struggle to get into because I, although I, I was interested in it, I, I didn't know a lot about it, but I definitely know a lot more now. Definitely don't know, uh, enough to say that I'm an expert or someone that could teach an exercise psychology course. Absolutely not. Uh, but because I didn't know a lot about it, and this is somewhat of a lesson, uh, if you uh, don't know something and you are uh, you recognize you don't know a whole lot about a certain topic, try to find some ways to motivate yourself to learn it. Uh, again, you don't have to be an expert. You don't have to get an undergraduate degree or a master's <laughs> degree in it to, to know a little bit about it. But if it is somewhat of an interest and in maybe trying to find certain videos or maybe books that would help you uh, become interested in it. So you learn a little bit more about it It may help you in the field. In fact, it's going to help me explain some of this stuff and go over it in class. That, that was kind of the whole reason for it. And plus, if I want to do any research studies in the future that has a little bit of this psychology in it, that's important. That's important to know. And, and not just important to know that, but possibly get to know some of the people in the field of exercise and sports psychology. Speaking of which, I have one story that I do want to say uh, and talk about. Uh, do want to say? <laughs> it was kind of weird. I don't want to talk about. Uh, again, I I tell stories a lot, and I know some students. Um, you know, every once in a while, I'll get get complaints. Well, oh, he gets off on these tangents, and he uh, don't even you know. I wish he would just stick to the PowerPoint. But 
the PowerPoint sometimes can be boring, right? I, I try to spice it up a little bit and I try to bring in stories that help reiterate the point or help to back up everything that I'm, that I'm talking about. So one story that I'll talk about is I was on a, uh, a search committee that was uh, for an exercise in sports psychologist. And we were bringing in candidates that wasn't here at, at Wilmington. It was a previous job. And uh, one of the candidates we brought in, she was uh, studying injuries in, in sports. And I think I can't even remember what she was actually trying to look at. But one strange thing that she found uh, kind of strange thing that she found was that she had this one particular athlete. He was a football player. He was a quarterback. He had this injury. I believe it was a shoulder injury. And he, he went through the rehabilitation the doctors, the trainers, everybody was saying he's, he, he's fine. He is, I mean, nothing is showing up on any of the x-rays or the MRIs. Uh, his, um, um, his rotation of his shoulder looks good. Internal, external rotation. All the numbers were looking good. All the parameters were saying he's healed. He's fine. But he kept saying, no, something's something. It just isn't right. I'm still having a little bit of pain. Uh, and they couldn't pinpoint it. He kept saying, oh, the pain's here. And I don't know. It's kind of when I do this or that, uh, whatever movement he was giving. And they could not figure out where the pain was coming from. So she started interviewing him because she was interested in the injuries in play. I think it was players getting back on the field, just kind of a general aspect of, uh, you know, what's the psychology or what psychological aspects uh, that she was actually looking at uh, when players get back onto the field. And what she found out asking a series of questions was he was no longer in pain. The trainers and the doctors were correct in that he was healed. However, he explained that he didn't like the sport anymore. In fact, he, he, uh, I believe, excuse me, I believe he actually said that he just, he hated it and he's hated it for a while. The reason he was continuing to play was because he didn't want to leave his father down. Because his father was trying to push him from an early age. Um, he was uh, really upset that the, the player was upset that he, um, if he quit, it would upset his father. Um, so he used the injury as a way out. And he didn't want the injury to end. That is very profound. That's a... Um, Again, a situation that has a lot of different levels to it and can't just be explained uh, just by a simple psychological test. Uh, there's a lot there going, going on. Uh, so that is some things that can open up a whole new line of research in that you can determine uh, or start to look at why some people continue to play sports even though they don't like them. Like, like the sports, is it something extrinsic? Like that intrinsic motivation is now gone. Kind of the only intrinsic motivation that they really have is that they don't want to feel bad about making somebody else feel bad. All right. A, uh, could be a, another coach could be a parent. Uh, and also there's a lot of research that is around surrounding, uh, pushing, kids to play certain sports, uh, or to play, uh, uh, a lot of sports or not allowing them to play sports. Um, and that's kind of part of this. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of different anecdotal stories surrounding people that are pushed into athletics and pushed into certain, uh, could even be certain fields of study possibly because their parents want them to do it, you know, and it's, um, there's a social aspect to it. Uh, societal aspect and psychological aspect now, and how does that affect somebody moving forward? And especially when they have kids, 
Are they going to react the same way that they feel like, oh, they need to push their son or daughter into a certain sport or a lot of sports or a certain uh, direction? Um, or are they going to go the opposite direction and just say, you can do whatever you want and I don't care. <laughs> you know, who, who knows? Or will they say, will that person, if they have a son say, you're never playing football ever, right? That, that would be literally the complete opposite direction where they uh, uh, are prohibiting them from playing the sport. So uh, that is one area or a couple areas there. There's a lot there to dive into, but there's some areas there where a sports psychologist could study. And uh, to me, that's interesting. That that's, uh, that's fascinating. Um, and again, the actual brain chemistry, uh, behind it and how to actually study that and what are the parameters to study that stuff is, is fascinating to me. So, but again, I'm kind of a dork, so I, I find a lot of stuff fascinating just because some things I don't know. Uh, <laughs> strangely enough, I don't know some things, but I, I find those the most fascinating. Uh, and that's why I continue to try to learn. Um, not to say that I'm abandoning the physiology, but I also like the psychological aspect of it too. So anyway, that was my story for this one. If you have any other questions, if you, any other questions, I don't even know if you had any questions now, I guess. Uh, anyway, where am I at? Sometimes I just ramble. All right. Uh, my coffee is pretty much out now. Uh, so if you have any questions in the comments, please leave them down below or email me, do whatever you would like to. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching the video. If you're watching the video on YouTube and, uh, take care. Thanks. Later. Later. I, I, I never know how to end these videos. Why, why can't I come up? Like, I wish I could come up with some regular way to end them. And I don't know, like I got these things on my, my mixer here. Let's, let's, let's see here. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs>